Job chapter 12. We got through Zophar, and he, he's, you know, not one of Job's nicest friends. Huh? You were in chapter 15. You jumped ahead of us a little bit. Um, anyhow, he's very accusatory, very just, you know, bringing charges against Job, flat out calling him a liar pretty much. Um, verse 12, for an empty-headed man will be, will be wise uh, when a wild, donkey colt, a wild donkey's colt is born a man. You know, when a donkey can give birth to a man, then somebody who speaks like you will be considered a wise man. That's not very nice. I mean, that's a lot of name calling, a lot of, a lot of, of uh, you know, just, just, you know, I don't know. I mean, he does, he flat out, I can't remember what verse it is, but he really just calls him a deceitful person and a wicked person and a liar. And if you would just stop doing that and tell the truth and all these things would be relieved and all that. So we're going to see Job in chapter 12. I'm going to just kind of fire off right here at the beginning at all three of them. These are, these are plural words when he says uh, here in verse 2, well, let me just start with verse 1. It says, then Job answered and said, no doubt you, that's a plural you, you are the people, uh, and wisdom will die with you. <laughs> so he's not, you are, it's like saying, you're the man, I know you're the man, you have all the wisdom, you know everything of God, and so <laughs> when, when you guys die, there won't be a wise man left in the world. Yes. Obviously very sarcastic, shooting back, so we see a little bit of, of, uh, of self-defense and, and <laughs> a little... A little bit of Job not worried, not worried about firing a shot back. So verse three says, uh, "But I, but I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Indeed, who does not know such things as these?" All right. So again, Zophar and even the others have gone on about how great God is. Remember, we talked about there's some truth in some of the things that they say that God addresses evil. That God, uh, you know. At times he does reward the faithful, and and um, and they've talked about creation and all that he's created, and how high God is above everyone else. And Job is saying, it, you know, I am not inferior to you. I understand all these things. You can hear in his words, he understands more than they do. He goes into greater detail than they do about how great God is. And uh, so then you get to verse four. He says, "I am, I am one mocked by his friends." That was another accusation of, of Zophar that he was basically mocking God by going on and saying anything about God. <clears throat> he says, I am one mocked by my friend or by his friends uh, who called on God and his and he answered him, the just and blameless who is ridiculed. So he says, I've talked to God. I've prayed. God. I've had my prayers answered by God before. There is no doubt that God is there. There is no doubt in the greatness of God. The implication here is I've asked for great things from God before, and he's answered my prayer, probably even in the way that he wanted him to. Who knows what Job saw because of his faithfulness of God working in his life, in the life of his kids, and the people around him, the wisdom that was maybe given to him as a counselor to other people, uh, or as a judge even to other people, and... He said, I, I've seen all of this. I, God has been active in my life. He's, verse 5 says, a lamp is despised in the, uh, in the thought of one who is, who is at ease. It is made ready for those whose feet slip. Right? He's basically, you, you despise me. The words that I've spoken are, are true. You despise my truth. You despise the truth of, of, of the light of God that I've tried to share. But it's, re it's made ready for those whose feet slip. You guys are about to fall. You've set yourself so high above other people. You're looking down on somebody that you know in the past has had wise counsel and have listened to my words and know that there's truth in my words. You're the ones who are about to slip. And he's kind of said this before. Basically, you want me to have something wrong with me so you know this won't happen because you're, you're afraid this could happen to you. And, and so you're, you're going to stick to this story of, 
a man, a righteous man, doesn't just lose everything that he has all in one day and then on another day, at another time, lose all of his health and everything else. You don't lose all that unless you've done something wrong. You guys are banking on that argument because if it's not true, this could happen to you. God could test you the way he's testing me. And it, this is just a, a kind of another reiteration of that. Do the tents of robbers prosper and those who provoke God are secure in what God provides by his hand? All right, so he's able to look around. This charge that you, because Job has done something wrong, some wickedness in his life that he won't confess, God has taken him to task. God has, has stripped him of everything, including his health. And, and Job is saying, look, you can look up and see people who are known to be wicked people and see that they prosper, see that they're, they are wealthy, they have influence, they have great influence. And even the ones who provoke God are secure. What, doesn't that speak of some of the of the people who are speaking in our country right now. Great, great influence. They are, are elected officials. They got, they've got the press to put their words out there. They can speak. They have all kinds of influence. And we can look at them and say, you guys are wicked. This is very much against God. What you're saying is against God. You know? Uh, and they're secure. And they're not only are they secure, they're secure in what God provides by his hand. He's going to get into this a little more later on, but he's starting into this. God sets people up and God takes people down, both the righteous and the unrighteous. And we see that all throughout the Bible. That's a teaching that is all throughout the Bible. David didn't fight against countries who had no king. He fought against other kings. Um... Daniel was a slave to a, a pagan king who had to be brought down by God. And, and Nebuchadnezzar comes out of that time in chapter 4 of Daniel saying, basically, agreeing with Daniel, God sets up kings and God takes down kings. You know? Nebuchadnezzar walking around in his arrogance saying, look at all that I've made. And God says, oh, really? You did this? I gave it to you. And just to show you that I gave it to you, I'm going to take it away for just a little while. And I'm going to preserve it, and I'm going to give it back to you. you know, and you see a, a huge change in Nebuchadnezzar. I would not be surprised to see him in heaven. And, you know, so Daniel, or Daniel, Job is kind of getting into this right now. This is kind of the very beginning of it. You know, the, the, the robbers, the tents of robbers prosper. People who are stealing are not, are still free. People who provoke God. The one who's who's given them their security, and, and and he still leaves them there for a time for his purpose. It says, but now ask the beast, and I think this is kind of a shot back at the whole donkey comment there in chapter or, uh, verse twelve of, of chapter eleven. It says, but now ask the beast, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea who. Uh, and the sea will explain to you who among all these uh, does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this in who uh, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind does not the ear test words and the mouth taste its food wisdom is with uh, aged men in the length of days and with the length of days understanding all right so Look around. Ask the beast, the, the animals, the birds, the fish. They all teach you of God. That should take us right to Romans chapter 1. That nobody will be able to stand in front of God without an excuse or with an excuse. Because the evidence of his eternal Godhead is in all of creation. We should be able to study creation. We should be able to study biology and, and anatomy and all that. And see, whole oh man, this is designed. This is all on purpose. None of it's an accident. And he's just saying to him, listen, you, you guys, you don't even have to be some kind of PhD to understand that God's there and God exists. And, and the greatness of him. 
You don't have to be that. You don't have to be some university tenured professor to be able to have wisdom and understanding. And most of them are proven all they have is knowledge and no wisdom to go with it anyways most of the time. But um, you, you don't have to. Kids can understand. They can look at creation and understand there's something way bigger than me that did this. You know, it, we have to teach them to not look for God. If you start talking to a kid about all that was made, you just mention God and he'll run with it. In his imagination, oh, man, somebody made this? Now his imagination about how it was made and why it was made. And isn't that cool? And, isn't, and they just think of the awesomeness of God in their, in, their, in their very young youth and innocence. It's when they begin to get older and they gain some of this bad knowledge. And then they think they have some wisdom to try to explain away the one who created it all. And what you end up with, according again to Romans chapter 1, is a debased mind. You can't discern anything of God. And, and that's, that is what we see. That's what Job is alluding to here. And, and even just the basics of, the, of the, the function of the human body. Doesn't the ear test words and the mouth taste food? That We understand that. In a very basic sense. I mean, nobody's trying to shove food in their ear to see how it tastes. You know? So, he concludes that thought with wisdom is with the aged men. And the length of days, and with the length of days, understanding. You You guys should have more understanding, really, of who God is. You have, you have knowledge of who God is. But they're showing these men who are older than his dad or as old as his dad, they're showing a lack of wisdom. They've gotten stuck at something where they think they've had an an aha moment where they have some great understanding, and they're stuck there. And they can't see beyond it anymore. And and they, they don't have wisdom. They maybe were on a journey toward wisdom, and some understanding, but they got stuck in one point and then just said, okay, time to move on to something else. And the point is, a righteous man is always taken care of by God. An unrighteous man, or even a righteous man who becomes unrighteous, is always taken down by God. And if you lose your standing here, you that must mean you've lost your standing with God for some reason, and there's got to be a reason for it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the place where you're at. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. I, I listened, I don't know why I do this, but I listened for about 15 minutes to a, a, a wealth teacher. You know, you, you, it's all about the way you think, and it's all about, and, and he's so vague, and he runs around in circles so much, 15 minutes was all I could take, and and I'm going, man, you just, you're not even giving anybody any direction. This is not somebody who's sitting down and saying, hey, listen, if you would be, um, you know, diligent here, then this is going to increase your wealth. And the biggest problem is, you know, God will increase your wealth, but there's never with any response, not one time did he say, for the responsibility of building the kingdom. It was never God will increase your wealth to do his service. It was always God will just increase your wealth. The entire thing that I listened to. And like I said, I can only listen to 15 minutes of it and I couldn't stand it anymore. And I didn't want to break my phone by throwing it. So, you know, it's just, it's not true and it's the same here. And, it, you know, for some, it is given to be, we saw this in Hebrews last week the, at the conclusion of chapter 11 in the beginning of chapter 12. For some, especially the conclusion of chapter 11, for some, they were elevated to great positions of authority. They subdued kingdoms. They, they, you know, they established Israel. They were wealthy. They had all of this stuff. And for some, it was a life of speaking the truth to people who wouldn't receive it in destitution, homeless, you know, camel hair or what is it? It was sheep and goat hair, but it made me think of John the Baptist. 
But, you know, they looked like wild men because that's where they lived was in caves. They didn't have homes. They didn't have communities. They, they just, you know, they were the untouchables. And nobody would listen to them. And that was what was dealt to them by God. You look at somebody like that and say, well, they had faith enough to deliver the word of God, but they don't have faith enough to receive it into their own life. And that's really honestly what these guys teach. It really is. It's really just a big circle that, anyways, I'm off on a, on a tangent here. But this is what these guys are teaching. It's the same thing, and, and Job's taking them to the task. You should have greater understanding than what you do. Verse 13. I mean, he's, he's really being pretty harsh with these three. With him are wisdom and strength. And the him is capitalized, so it's with God are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. If he breaks a thing down, it cannot be rebuilt. If he imprisons a man, there can be no release. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overflow the earth. You know, and maybe he's close enough to the flood, pre, pre-Adam, or Abraham. So sometime between Noah and Abraham is his lifetime, we believe. Maybe he's, he's thinking about the flood, you know. He withholds waters, they dry up. If he sends, wa- sends them out, they overwhelm the earth. With him are strength and prudence. The deceived and the, and the deceiver are his. So there is nobody higher than him, Job is saying. You almost get a glimpse into chapter 1 and chapter 2 with Job here, where, where Satan is appearing before God. God is in charge of every living being, every single one. He, he holds um, authority over every single one. He leads counselors away plundered. He makes fools of the judges. He lo- <laughs> All right. I'm just going to say this one more time. This sounds like our time. We should tell you, nothing's changed. <laughs> Nothing has changed among, among men. He leads counselors away, plundered. He makes fools of the judges. He loosens the bonds of the kings. He binds their waist with a belt. He leads princes away, plundered, and overthrows the mighty. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours out contempt on princes and disarms the mighty. He uncovers deep things out of darkness and brings the shadow of death to light. He makes makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. He takes away the understanding of, of the chiefs of the people of the earth. He makes them wander in path in pathless in a pathless wilderness. They grope in the dark without light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. And if those last few verses don't explain, don't don't shed some light on these first few months of this year with our new Congress, unbelievable. Some of them sound like drunken people with the ideas and the things that they're saying. It doesn't make sense the things that they are are proposing, and then even when their own party knocks them down, it doesn't. They still are like, you know, who are you to knock me down? This is wisdom that I've just put out here. This is not wisdom that they're putting out. It's not, you know. But in the same respect, God's in charge of all of this. So does does God inspire the words? Maybe in a sense. What he's doing is he's revealing the hearts of people and he's revealing the lack of wisdom of those who do not seek him. He's, he's exposing them for what they are. He absolutely is. So in that sense, yes, he's in charge of what they're writing. He's in charge of the news reports. He's in charge of the statements and the press releases and all the other junk that they have. He, he's, he's in charge of all that. He's letting it happen. He's making it happen. He's exposing mankind all over the world right now for who we really are. You know, and I'll tell you. Some of the youngers, I've, I've had discussion with some younger people in the, in the past couple of weeks, and they don't see it. They don't see it. Oh, no. Well, men always rally together. Men always take care of each other. Men all, 
No, we don't. We don't. And the more of history I'm digging into, the more I find out we really didn't take care of each other very well back then. We broke into factions just like we are right now. And then we went to war with each other. You know, it, it's it's the same thing. It, it That just... I mean, we can we can... We can look over history and we can say, yeah, you know what? There were times of, of destitution and people rallied together and they overthrew governments. But according to this, they didn't overthrow the government. God did. God builds up a nation. God brings it back down and then he builds it up again. We can look at our own nation. Even just looking at just the economy of our nation in the last 20 years, we can see that happen. It grows, it swells. We dishonor God. We're more vocal about it. It collapses. It stays there for a while. And then when we when we push and we're praying and we want it grows back up again, but it's for his purpose. And really, if you want to take it a little bit farther and a little bit deeper on that, he's describing the birth pains of of the nations, of the people, of all of creation waiting to be redeemed. By their redeemer, and the and even then, I mean, really, that does describe a birth pain to to come up, and to go back down, and to come up, and to go back down, and it, it's just, it, it is what it is, and then he ends that whole thought with they grow up in the dark without light. If you don't have Jesus, if you don't have the understanding of His Word, if you don't have His Word in your life, active in your life, it's like groping in the dark. They are literally grasping for straws for meaning and understanding in life. And they all, you know, you have people all over the place that are in positions of authority saying, I've got the meaning of life. I've got the reason why we are where we're at. I know the solution to this problem. I know the solution to that problem. And when they spit out their solutions or their ideas, like I said, it's just like a drunken person. It doesn't make any sense. It they're staggering around like they don't know what they're doing or who they are. But that's, that's anybody who is resisting God, has no real understanding of who God is, and is not patient to give discernment. Even some Christians are spewing off or, and shooting off their mouths, and they don't know what they're saying. Or they're speaking too soon. I've done it. I've, I've, I've done it. I've said some things, and then... A couple days later, I'm going, what was I thinking? I should have just waited. I should have just waited a little bit longer. I would have been a lot wiser to just have shut my mouth. In fact, we're going to get to a statement similar to that in this if we get far enough tonight. If I'd have just been quiet a little bit longer, I'd have been good, you know. Verse Chapter 13, verse 1 says, Behold, my eyes, or my eye has seen all of this. My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you, but I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. Now, listen, that right there, I've resisted saying something like this, but this comes to mind this very thing that I could say to some of the younger generations right now, because that lack of, and now he's turning it around. This is an older generation looking down on him. But right now we have a generation of people that are telling us, you guys are too old. You need to sit down. You need to shut up. You don't know what you're saying. Listen to us. We got all the answers and they haven't lived 35 years yet, but they know it all. They got it all. And I'm like, you act like I'm inferior to you because I'm older. And and even, and this is really a weird generation right here where we're at, especially those of us in our, our 50s and 60s. Man, the generation in the 70s were nuts, and the generations behind us are crazy. And it's just weird. None of them thinks we have any idea about what we're doing. It, it's like the hippie generation just skipped, boom, plop, and landed behind us. And I'm like, you guys, this you understand, your great-grandparents did all this and said all this, and it was really dumb then, and it's really dumb now. <laughs> you know? I just, anyhow, all right, I'm getting on my own tangent. 
But that's just my observation. And, and I'm trying to hold myself back. Thankfully, I haven't said this to anybody. I'll try not to, but really? It, huh? It is an interesting thought. What you know, I also know. But now let's talk wisdom. <laughs> you know, I have knowledge. You have knowledge. I am not inferior to you, but I would speak to the Almighty. I and I desire to reason with God. He's saying, I'm not afraid of him. He's already stated in the last chapter that God has answered his prayers. I'm not afraid of him. I want to reason with God. I want to understand what he's doing. I want to know why this is happening. Not in a disrespectful way where he's going to stand up and say, you are horrible, God, and you are a mean God, and you are all the things you hear about hear people saying about God now. Oh, man, if God's like that, I don't want nothing to do with him. Uh, well, you need to reconsider what you're saying and and why things are the way they are. He's like, I, I would speak to the Almighty. I, would des I desire to reason with him. I want to. And now he gets, again, zapping at those guys but you forgers of lies you are all worthless physicians oh that you would be silent and that and it would be uh, and it would be your wisdom you you speak lies if you would just be quiet that would be considered wisdom you know what's the the, the saying uh, better to to be quiet and have people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt you know, that's that's what he's saying to him. This you're worthless physicians as long as you're talking. Just be quiet. Just be quiet, it would be better. So verse six, now hear my reasoning and heed the pleading of my lips. Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Will you show partiality for him? You know, are you gonna decide who's better, who God considers to be a better person? More deserving person, right? Uh, will you contend for God? Are you God's lawyer, basically? Will it be well when he searches you out? Or can you mock him as one mocks a man? He will surely rebuke you if you secretly show partiality. He will not, or will not his excellence make you afraid and the dread of him fall upon you? Your platitudes are proverbs of ashes, your defenses are defenses of clay. Wow, your words are weak, basically. There's no substance to what you're saying. You're, you're saying things that, that have some truth to them, but they're just full of holes or things. And what would happen if God searched you out? Job is never saying, I'm sinless. He's just saying, I don't know what I did. I don't think I did anything. I have a relationship with God. I would speak to God. I would, I would reason with him. I want to know what he has to say. I'm not just speaking what I've decided he would want you to say. I know what he wants to say. You know, before I open my mouth for God, basically, I'm going to seek him. I'm gonna, I want to know, I want to have his understanding before I say anything for him. He says, but will it be well with you? Will it be well when he searches you out? Not if. You notice that little shot. Is it going to be well when he searches you out? When he tries you, when he tests you, is it going to go well? Are you going to respond well? Are you still going to have your faith? Is it still going to be intact? There's a whole lot in that little that little sentence that that Job is throwing at him. A whole lot that they should be considering with that, that question. A whole lot that we should be considering. If God decides to test us, if he decides, and, and, and he's testing Job because he loves him. And he's not testing Job because Job needs to be tried and he needs to be you know, rebuked and he needs to be beaten or punished. He was bragging on him. He loves Job. He says, look at my servant. There's nobody like this guy. You know, and, you know, it, it's just, 
when God tests us, is it going to be well with us? Will it be okay when God searches you out? Now, we've gone through some things. Everybody's gone through some things. Everybody's gone through hard times, devastating times. And to my knowledge, as far as I know and anything I know about you guys, the answer is yes, we're going to come out on the other side. We may go through some phases like Job. We may cycle like Job. I wish this was done. I wish I could go home. Lord, just blow the trumpet. I'm done. But we come out of it and we're like, yeah, look at how God brought us through. Look at, and we, hopefully you're giving the glory and honor to God during the trial and after the trial, especially after the trial. It would seem it's a little easier after. Um, <laughs> with the understanding that when you're giving God the glory after the trial, you're also giving him glory before the next one. <laughs> it's the same time frame, right? Anyways. Uh, will not his excellence make you afraid and the dread of him fall upon you? Are, are you concerned about being in front of God at all? Job's willing to go, but Job's also described his, his immense um, respect for God. He knows. He, a couple chapters back. He knows. You don't accuse God. He knows. God is above even having to answer him. And yet he'll still go to him and he'll ask. But these guys are just like, yeah, psh, I tell you, I'll tell you what God wants. I'll tell you what God says. I'll tell you what God means. And he says, aren't you afraid of him? You're speaking like men who are not afraid of God. Boy, man, isn't that, again, we don't have to even get outside the pulpit. We don't have to get outside the church. There are many men in the church that are speaking and, and, and saying things that are not godly and they're not afraid. Or they're, they're doing things like blessing abortion clinics, and they're not afraid. And, and Job would say, are you not in dread of him at all? Are you not afraid to stand before him at all? And the warning, your platitudes, your words, your sayings of ashes, they're like ashes. Your defenses are, are defenses of clay. You can't stand, you have nothing to stand in front of God with that is of any value unless he's placed it in your hands. None of that's going to hold anything for you. It'll all break up and, and fall away or blow away. Verse 13 says, hold your peace with me and let me speak. You can almost imagine, can't you? He's fired off these charges and they're like, hey, and he's like, no. You be quiet, you're going to let me speak. Why do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in, in my hands? Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. Everything's before God, not you. I'm not worried about you guys, and I'm not worried about impressing you guys. I'm worried about being right before God. You know, and, and he, he alone, he also shall be my salvation. For a hypocrite could not come before him. Listen carefully to my speech and to my declaration with your ears. <laughs> Pay attention. See now, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be vindicated who is he who will contend with me if now I hold my tongue, I perish? Man, you guys have said too much for me to just be quiet. There's a lot of days when I, like, you know, a couple Sundays ago when I when I addressed the abortion issue and everything was going on, and I come down and I, I said to at least, at least to my wife, if not to a couple of you guys, I don't know. I don't know if I should have went there. I don't know if I should have gone that far with it. But I just couldn't not say anything. I know that's the wrong way to say it, but I just I just couldn't be quiet. And and it wasn't if it came across angry, that wasn't my intent for it to come across angry. But at the same time, a little indignant. This is unholy. This is wickedness. This is against God. And I I just 
couldn't keep my mouth shut. Which one? Oh, in Congress, yeah, where they blocked the bill. Yeah. I know. Well, the... Well, there's, they're not, I think, if I'm understanding it right, it was more put out to really show who's, what side of the issue you were on. Because it's going to be a state issue anyways. It's not going to be a federal government issue. But I don't think they had any, any, any thought of the matter was going to be solved on that bill. And I don't really think the, that the Republican Party or whoever put the bill out really thought it was going to pass. I think this is really to expose everybody for what side they were on. And it went further, it went further to divide our country. We are, we are severely divided on this issue, and there's a couple other issues we are severely divided on. And I'm, I'm going to stand by my statement that we have not been this divided since the Civil War. Not not since the '60s, not since the the '50s and, and all that, well, with the civil rights movement and everything. We haven't been this divided on this many issues since bef right before the Civil War. That does not bode well for our nation, you know. And and you will have, and we do have, we have a part of the nation that wants to honor life. Even if they're not believers, they're, there's a respect and an honor for life, and they're going in that direction. And there's a part of the nation that says, we decide who breathes and who doesn't. And, and that's not okay. And we're kind of a little bit off topic here with that, but, but still, I, you know, my point was that there's a time when you can't not speak, when you, when you can be quiet. Right, and exactly, and to be honest with you, and I think I, I kind of expressed this at the end of the service, my issue wasn't with the women. My issue was with the lawmakers who are directing our nation into a place that's dark and evil. That was my issue. It wasn't, it wasn't with the women. And I, and I made sure that I said, hey, man, you can be forgiven. If you participated in this, that's not the unforgivable sin. You can be forgiven of it. You know, and God stands ready. Jesus stands ready to receive them for sure. And, uh, and, and, so, and, and that had to be said too. And I wished actually that I had said that at the beginning with all the other statements that I made. But, um, you know, for fear that some people may have tuned out uh, before before I got to that. But um, there, there's just, Job has taken so much from these guys. And, the, and he's seeing so much misrepresentation of God and God's truth. By taking some of God's truth and then wrapping it up with their own commentary and their own opinion. That he just, he can't be quiet about it anymore. And he's really being very direct with them, that we, as we've seen in these in these last couple of chapters. Only two things do not in verse twenty. Only two things do not do to me. Then I will not hide myself from you. And this is, I believe, this is him speaking to God. Withdraw your hand far from me, and let not the dread of you make me afraid. Then call, and I will answer. Or let me speak, then you can respond. To, then you respond to me. And he's 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 now corresponding with God. He's now praying to God. Only two things that I don't want you to do to me, and I will not hide myself from you. Withdraw your hand far from me, and let not the dread of you make me afraid. Now. It almost sounds like he wants him to withdraw his hand from him. Like this is an oppression, but he's saying don't. He said two things do not do to me. So really, don't withdraw your hand far from me. And don't let the dread of you make me afraid. So there, there's, it, it almost seems wrong to say that we need to still have a fear of God. And he, even he says here, that's a pretty heavy word, even a dread of God. But don't let that make me afraid. As, 
as wonderful at times as it, it should be and as good as it should make us feel to think about and to contemplate, to look at and to try to understand the greatness of God by his word and by his creation at the same time as that that, that should cause us to rejoice inside at the exact same time it should bring some dread to us too of who he is how how far from his wisdom we are you know it, i think I, I i talked about this a couple of weeks ago to think that, that he by his hand has stretched out the universe and and which not too long ago, you've got some physicists that have decided that the universe is infinite. Well, if the universe is infinite, there's no Big Bang. So now you've got to really readjust your ideologies there. But you think about that. How big is the universe? If you could get outside of all of the galaxies, outside of the universe, and, and there's God. And in the middle of it, as vast as the universe is, as big as it is, He's come through all of that to one galaxy, to one solar system, to one planet, to each individual person on that planet and said, I love you. I died for you. you know, that's amazing. And if I look just inside the scope of what I can see, and even just what, within what I can see with a telescope, that's amazing. That's some rejoicing. Even inside of our galaxy, you see some of the pictures that we get from the Hubble telescope and, and some other things. And just how brilliant the colors are and the things that he did. And you can just get kind of caught up into it. And then you realize he's in all of it and he's outside of all of it at the same time. And one day, I'm going to get to stand in front of him. And at the same time that that will make me rejoice, at the same time, it's like, man, that's super humbling. Because he calls us to himself, but there's no way for us to get there unless we understand Jesus and unless we know Jesus. He, he really, literally, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, he narrowed that scope right down to one. And as, as much as we, we have the church and there's a community there and, and we all have experienced the salvation of our Lord and we all look forward to his soon return, even if we've got some eschatological differences or whatever that, that we can play around with and kind of make fun of each other or even or whatever, as long as you can do it and not condemn the other person. But... We can have some differences, but at the same time, we look forward to the same thing, seeing him, being with him, his return. And anything outside of that sets you in front of God who created it all, and you're denying him. And there is no dread in a man who's wicked like that. Their hearts have become so hard and so cold, they don't fear God. But what he did for us humbles. It should humble us. And, and, and think, I mean, if you think about it too much, I mean, I don't know if you can think about it too much, but if you think about it a lot, it could, it could really, I could see somebody just... <laughs> Setting on that, and you could be curled up in a corner somewhere. Oh, excuse me, curl up in a corner somewhere. You know, just you couldn't get small enough. You know, I, I've I've told you guys I've had those moments with God in prayer when I can't get low enough, when I I just know I sense His presence with me at that moment. And not that He's not always there. Not that the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell me, but He is just made his presence so overwhelmingly known to me at that moment that I I can't get low enough on the floor. I don't want to even be sitting up in, in, in front of him. I don't want to speak a word. I'm afraid to breathe. 
And that might sound weird and it might sound kind of crazy for anybody who's never had even close to that moment with him, but that's the dread. I didn't tell you, I didn't feel joy in those moments. That was a dread. And the one time I can really remember that really being a, a super intense moment, I was questioning what he wanted me to do. And it's not about being a pastor. It was about, I was, I was really, I was complaining. I was supposed to go to Africa. I was supposed to go over there and, and teach the chaplains in Sudan. And, and all of a sudden, one day, it got blown up. And now you can't go at this time. you got to go on this date. And I'm trying to arrange time off with work. And I'm trying to do all this stuff. And, and, and what am I going to do? And, man, now i got to try to change this. And I'm just kind of complaining to myself. I don't think I was really even complaining to God. And then all of a sudden, it was just like, whew. And I was afraid to move. And it was just kind of like, am I in control of this or are you? And I ended up not going. And I didn't end up not going. I don't think I made a bad decision. I made the right choice for the time. I was completely okay with making the choice. But, in fact, once I, I made the decision, not long after that moment, to, that, all right, I'm not going to go. And I'm going to be at peace with not going. I'm just not going to go. And I canceled all of my leave. I can't, you know, all of that stuff with work. It was like a day or two later. Okay, they moved the dates back to where they were originally. Well, I can't go now. I've just, I've just canceled everything. Are you sure? Listen, I'm okay with this. I really am. I'm not afraid to go. I wanted to go, but and it ended up being I needed to be here for a, not a emergency emergency, but for some family issues. I needed to be here at that time. And if I'd have gone, then Tracy would have had to deal with it by herself. But I was here, and. But that, that moment, I mean, literally, I'm in my work van. I wanted to get out. I was this close to just getting out of my car. People would have thought I was nuts because I was going to, I was like, I need to be face down. I need to not move. I didn't move my truck. I just parked it. I was like, this is, this is scary. And not scary like I thought I was going to die, but at the same time, still feeling like I'm afraid to breathe. I'm afraid to move. I'm afraid to do anything. But... Yeah, you know, and and then there's other times when it's just a an overwhelming joy and and even joy to crying, you know, like when my babies were born and being there for that and just this this sense of wow, man, just blow my mind and and how crazy God is and how just amazing this is that this happened and I don't mean crazy God like you know he's nuts but just he just it, the whole thing blew me away, especially with, with Hope, our first one. Oh, my word, I was a wreck. I was a wreck. When, for those of you who know Brennan Ashleman, that was the youth pastor up in Kalamazoo when we were there, he, I, I went up when he had, they had their first baby, and he pulls me aside. I said, man, I was, I was okay. I was holding it together. I decided to go get us some food. I got in the car, and I just sat there for like 20 minutes and just bawled my eyes out. I couldn't believe what I just saw. I couldn't believe it. I was just, just, I said, I know I was there. I've been there a couple times now, you know, so it, it's just, it's amazing and fury at the same time. So you, you, you know, for sure you have great, super high moments and, and God's just tickled to tickle you a little bit or whatever, however you want to put it. And you know, he's just, he just makes him happy to make you full of joy. And other times when he's just like, hey, you know what? It's kind of a Job moment. You need to be quiet for just a second and think about who I am. <laughs> all right. You know all things. You are all things. I know nothing. <laughs> right at this moment, I don't know anything but to be still and be quiet. And we'll see that at the end. Job gets 71 questions fired at him, and he can't answer any of them. That's kind of that moment of... Um, you know what? I'm kind of sorry I ever opened my mouth, <laughs> ever, or even thought a thought. I'm kind of sorry for that. Oh, my goodness. All right. Where did we leave off? Verse 23. How many are my iniquities and, and sins? And I know we're running along, but we'll get this chapter done. How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my transgressions and my sin. Why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? Will you frighten a leaf driven to and fro? 
Uh, and will you pursue dry stubble? For you write bitter things against me and make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. You put my feet in the stocks and watch closely all of my paths. You set a limit for the soles of my feet. Man decays like a rotten thing, like a garment that is moth-eaten. That's, you know, pretty good realization of what's going to happen. Regardless of whether he was in this or regardless of whether he was still a wealthy man, he knows his days were limited. Yeah. Are you going to, are you still pursuing me? Are you still there? Are you, what are you doing in this? How are you in this? What, what is, because I know what this looks like from my perspective, but what does this really look like from your perspective? Are you really chasing me down here? You know, I'm sitting here, I don't have anything else to do, so I'm just thinking about everything I did wrong as a kid <laughs> in my younger years. And, you know, it's like I'm just locked up. I can't move forward. I can't do anything. I can't go back. But you watch all of my paths. You set a limit for the soles of my feet. You know how far I'm going. You know the day I take my last step. You know, man decays like a rotten thing. One of these days, I'm just going to be done. This body's going to be done. It's going to be worthless and useless. And I'm just, it's just how it's going to be. Like a, a garment that is moth eaten. Just something that tears easy, something that can't hold up. That's that on our own without knowing God. And, and now we know that Job knew God. And we know that Job believed that he would see him one day in his flesh. So he believed in the resurrection. But man on his own, nothing. We're nothing. So anyhow, <clears throat> less than nothing. We are very fragile. Basically, is what he's saying. We're already fragile. The older we get, the more fragile we're going to get. I would raise my hand and testify to that, but I can only raise my hand so far because I'm getting more fragile. So <laughs> anyways, let's pray. We're already run over, so... Lord, thank you for your words, and, and Lord, I pray that we would find encouragement in these, um, knowing that Job has gone through far more than, than probably we have all at once anyways, <clears throat> and yet you are mindful of Job, you're mindful of us. Uh, Lord, uh, at the same time that we know how, how broken down we are, how worthless we are without you how all of our efforts come to nothing if they're outside of your will. We also know that in your will, <clears throat> in spite of the circumstances, we have your grace and your mercy. It is amazing to know that we serve Almighty God. Lord, that you are outside of everything that you created, and at the same time, you, you fill everything that you created. There's so much about you that we cannot imagine or understand. But Lord, we look forward to an eternity with you. As we begin to have those things explained and know that even in eternity, forever and ever, we still won't know it all. We will never be you. You will always be far above us. You will always, always be the one teaching us, giving us understanding. Lord, most of all, you will always be the one loving us. You have prepared a way, and we're thankful for that. And I, remember, I pray that we remember that every single day, good days and bad days, Lord, that you have prepared a way, that you loved us enough to die for us, that you loved us enough to bring us the truth, and that you loved us enough to give us new life. Thank you, Lord, for all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>